Hello everyone, welcome to Cyber Inspiration Podcast. My name is Evgeny. I have been around cybersecurity for the last 20 years and I have a lot of experience working with a variety of cybersecurity vendors. My main work is vendor consulting and cybersecurity advisory for companies. As part of my passion in technology and cyber, I've been intrigued to learn how a company starts. I started the podcast to understand the thinking process and what motivated people to start their own company. This podcast is affiliated with Security Architecture Podcast. Hello, everyone. I'm very, very happy to be here. here today. We'll talk with Chuck Brooks about his not just new book, his first book. You've been around for a very, very long time. A lot of people know what you do. But in case somebody doesn't know, please tell us what you do day by day, and we'll talk about the book in a second. Sure. Day by day, I'm retired from a private industry where I worked at General Dynamics and Xerox and RapidScan and a few others, and also the U.S. government, where I was one of the first hires at the Department of Homeland Security and then worked 10 years on the Hill. But today now, I, I teach primarily at Georgetown University, where I'm in the Graduate Cybersecurity Risk Management Program. And I also do a lot of writing and speaking around the world, as well as some consulting. And you've probably seen me on LinkedIn. I have over 120,000 followers on there and run a bunch of groups. And I'm also a Forbes writer. So I keep busy. So this is podcast about inspiration. We cover many vendors and the inspiration to start the company. But recently, we started to cover book authors in cybersecurity mainly and their inspiration to write a book. So what happened in your life, and you did quite a lot, that kind of trickled and say, Chuck, you need to write a book? Well, a couple of things. One thing is that seven years ago, I designed my own course called Disruptive Technologies and Organizational Management for Georgetown, which focused on some of these technologies we're talking about today in their early stages, AI, quantum, IoT, 5G, et cetera, cloud, all those things. And for the last five, six years or so, they were just routine topics, but the world has changed. And as we all know from artificial intelligence, it's taken over every conference I've gone to. And that's all you hear is how AI is really transforming the, the, the digital landscape, the ecosystems. And so that was a, quite an inspiration. I said, you know what, with these topics and that I talk about in class, it would be good to, to write a book where I can reach out to both someone with a background, but more, more appropriately, someone that doesn't have a background in cybersecurity and look at the implications of all these new technologies that are coming online, such as artificial intelligence. You know, what, what implications does it have on our privacy? What is quantum going to do with our, our how 5G is going to our, our ability to, to transmit data? And of course, IoT, what does the Internet of Things mean when everything's connected and, and we need to look at new approaches to protect ourselves? So I put this in a book with the theme over uh, risk management for cybersecurity and, and emerging technologies. And, and I also focus on the other aspect of it, which is, of course, our privacy. Privacy is, is sort of a word that, that could have a lot of meetings for Vint Cerf, the founder of the internet and now a chief evangelist for, for Google says it doesn't exist anymore, but it is still something that we have to consider. And so all these technologies basically are, are usurping the landscape as we know it. And that was my inspiration. We're not going to jump to privacy even somewhere tempting and all this technology <laughs> because it could be a very interesting conversation. <laughs> we'll leave it for a different podcast. Yes. We're going to jump more of the inspiration about a book. So when you start writing a book, and my, I myself have this problem as well, you need to decide, do you go in the traditional publication road or are you doing self-publishing? What happened in your mind and where is the decision made for you? Yeah, I talked to some other authors that have done stuff, some self-published, some with uh, main brands. And I decided I'd go with a major publisher. I went with Wiley, which is known for educational publishing, but a lot of other, they're one of the bigger ones, but I think one of the top four or five in the world. And the difference when you go with a publisher like that is you're going to be dealing with lots of editors for the grammar, editors for the content, editors for the how you dial it, everything for the graphics. So it was a process. They give you timelines, which is good because I always write better when there's something that's due. <laughs> and it was an interesting process. That it took several months and took a lot of rewriting and writing. And I also had to dumb down a lot of stuff as being in the, in the field. We're used to talking to people at conferences that have a, a, a knowledge, an IT background, cyber background. And there's a lot of acronyms and there's a lot of things you assume people know. But when you're dealing with the general public or even dealing with, with just 95% of the public, the 5% that doesn't understand the implications of technology and cyber, you have to have it in a conversational way that they can understand the implications, how it relates to them. So that was the process. Yeah, I'm a big builder of soft skills. So yes, definitely we will talk to somebody, you want to create metaphors, you want to simplify your language. He's stopping 
becoming about you. It's more about what they understand and how they understand because there's a very audience. So as you mentioned, your audience is pretty much everyone or people that want to get in. I'm wondering, how did you decide who will be the audience? I was looking, I said, who is connected to the internet? And, and pretty much everyone, right? So it's a general audience. Of course, everyone doesn't read. And I've been writing for almost a decade now for Forbes. And the process is a little bit different there, but similar. You, you really want to put things in language people understand and to be pertinent to them. And so I thought I'd do the same kind of thing. I, I'll take complex topics like space cybersecurity, but you can't really make it all about uh, you know the relay systems and, 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 the, and the type of technologies you use. You really got to keep it in something they can understand. So I took the same approach, although I think I mixed a little bit in this book so people have a, a more of a depth and understanding, can understand things that I, that I put in there that may gloss over from the average reader, but they will get it when they read through it. Did you end up doing a lot of research on most of the topic it was top on your head and you just needed to summarize them? I did do a lot of research. I do it for my class anyway. And the interesting thing about the topics I'm writing about is that they're changing every week. There's always some sort of pivot. Artificial intelligence, generative AI, basically. It, there's a news break every week on some aspect of it. That, that continue, you have to, obviously, with the articles and academic research and, and more, more or less the industry stuff. You also have to get through the propaganda because everyone says they have stuff that they don't. But, and quantum is even more of a challenge, I think, because it's a smaller uh, group of people and, and most of them are scientists. So the, the type of stuff they write about you know, tends to be sophisticated. So to be able to break those concepts down is, is a little more challenging. Do you expect that you will have to release revisions every few years because stuff is changing? Or you expect that majority of the information will be relevant for five, six, ten years? I think the majority of my book will be relevant because I wrote broadly enough and I used anecdotal kind of things and, and I put it in, in how it relates to industries like healthcare and the consumer, the individual. So I encourage and throughout the book is a continual learning process when you're dealing with technology. If it doesn't stand still, it's not static. And so you always have to update, but I think it gives it a, a good basis for anyone to really spin off and, and go deeper into it. But my book is covering a lot of different technologies. AI is probably the most prevalent, of course, since it has so many aspects to the industries, but it's continually, you have to understand that what's happening in the next week and the, and the year after to, to really be conversant in this topic. Let's dive into the process itself. Everybody is different. People are different. Some people write when they have a good mood. Some people schedule time to write. What was your process? How you decided that you were able to be productive and also don't procrastinate too much? Yeah, that's always a problem. Since I do a lot of writing anyway on, on a variety of publications, I've always asked and always give me quick deadlines. And I, unfortunately, I always usually accept. But I'm used to pressuring myself and I don't understand the implications. My process was to go back through a lot of the stuff I've already written on those topics so I can refresh myself and see where I needed to fill in the gaps. And so it was building on what I've already written, which really was helpful because I think I started from scratch and not knowing these topics already and, and having stuff into my own content already. So it's I'm, I'm pulling from my own knowledge, but it's written in front of me. It's not just from my head. It would have been a much tougher task, but having done that. And then, of course, once you do to have that as a base, you look outside your knowledge base and you look for other things and, and organizational things, look for government, et cetera. But there's plenty of data out there and plenty of information. It's just really consolidating and making it explainable. This is the next topic. It's about creativity. You no, know, we have the spark, we are writing, and then, God, what am I doing all this? God, there's yeah. nobody going to read this. Oh, you just don't know what to write right now. So what keeps you creative and what keeps you to get back to actually writing what you do? And I hope it's going to help as you writers as well. Yeah, everyone's a little bit different. First of all, everyone gets writer's block at one point. There's no author in the world that doesn't have that. You can't be on all the time. So you really have to, to be in the right emotional mood. For me, sometimes it's just as easy as going to the gym first and working out and getting all, and then I can relax and let my mind work and not worry about what I have to do. It's already all my anxiety is pushed out. Or unfortunately, I'm an insomniac. And a lot of my ideas come at night when I'm just there thinking in bed. And so that I say, okay, I got to do that next morning. But creativity is something I think every writer needs. And I think also... When you look at, and one of the things I found is you write outside your topic of knowledge sometimes too. I've written on subjects where I knew little about, but I went and learned about it. And it gives you confidence. You know, say, oh, that's really interesting. I've never written on this aspect of that. And it may be away from cyber and technology, but it's still interesting. And then you go, it gives you confidence. Writing is all about confidence, really. Knowing that you can do it. 
And I think the other thing that, that helps is, is you stay current by going to a lot of the conferences and interacting with other experts and reading on social media. There's a whole group of people, including you, <laughs> that, that do a lot of sharing of knowledge on social media. So it's available. And it's good to get those perspectives. And after a while, you know who they are and you know where they're coming from and you know where their, their expertise is and you could draw from that. And that, that is also a good way to push your, your creativity looking at someone else has done. And I think it makes it fun too. And then talking to people, just talking to people. What I deal with my students. What would you like to see? What would interest you most in a book kind of thing? And I think it all builds up together. But again, you have to figure out that it's just the right time when you sit down and get in front of that computer that you're just going to determine to do what you need to do. Did you share the content with some people, with students? And was there a moment that you realized, okay, I'm on the right path. I'm doing something to help people and not just writing something going to be on somebody's shelf. Yes, because I see it in cyber already. I think that there's a lot of books coming out and a lot of them are friends. And I think they're all good. And I've written intros for them and endorsed them because what we're finding is we have a, an audience out there that's really, for the most part, ignorant of what cybersecurity is. They understand some things, but they don't even do the basics. So it's a continual. That's why you have Cybersecurity Awareness Month. It's just, it's a quest. And the more information you give them, the more opportunity they have to read books, the more articles you write, the more you speak. But I wanted to get something in a book that would have someone that could pick it up and, and, and maybe go to something that they have an interest in. Let's say they're interested in 5G or if they're interested in healthcare cybersecurity or risk management where they could use the book to supplement their knowledge or interest. So you could almost pick it up anywhere in the book and find a chapter that might be of, of interest at the time. It's not necessarily like written like a plot where you continue to go through a fiction book or even some nonfiction books would build up on something. It really is a compilation of different topics under the whole umbrella of cybersecurity, privacy, and, and the impact it may have on the future. If you can go back and give an advice to yourself, would you do something differently? I think I would. I think that I tend to, when I was back in college and grad school and, and et cetera, I used to go to the library and pull out a lot of books and then just keep it. The books around me, the papers, all that kind of stuff. And, and that's how I wrote for most of my life. And I just visited my alma mater and I went into the library and I found out there are no books. So <laughs> it's all digital. So that's the world we live in. So even more of an impetus to, to say, okay, I'm going to do more of my research online this time than I do typically. And so I think I learned that what most students do know now is that what you need to find out is mostly available if you know where to look and how to look for it. The key here is that you want to keep your original ideas intact because there's so much written already. And some of the basics are, are just going to be the basics. Cyber hygiene is written 50 million times. But you want to put it in your own thoughts. And, and sometimes that's uh, my advice to myself now is just go with it. Your impulses are and then fix it up later instead of necessarily looking at others to how they, they address the topics. And I tended to do that in my rewrite with that with the book. We have this concept that different people have different views on it of work-life balance. So how do you maintain work-life balance when you're writing the book? Yeah. The good thing is, again, is I'm a late night person, so I stay up at lights. I'm not late night, so I don't necessarily interfere with the family stuff that's going on. Also, my wife has a full-time job. My, my kids were in school a lot of the time. The work-life balance is really important. I'm finding now, because the way the world is, it's become a hybrid world and a remote world. People are better at adapting to the allocation of time. And I did this when I semi-retired, because I, I say semi-retired because I'm actually doing more than I was working in one position when I was working for a job, let's say for, I was Vice President of Homeland Security for Xerox, but there was a full-time job. You're there every day. There's always stuff. You come home, you work on weekends. Here, you get to make your own agenda. So I think the work-life balance is always important that you make your agenda that's comfortable. Sometimes you have no choice because you have a deadline, you have a deadline. And if you're working for a client, the client's always right. But you can balance that, particularly if you know if you're working from home. I do a lot more work from home than I ever did. And I don't have to commute. And commuting sometimes was two or three hours. So those two or three hours it adds to the work-life balance. So I think people are starting to realize that that a lot of the problems associated with the nine to five, 40 hour work week, where it was the commute times before and after, you're interfering with the morning and the dinner. And, and now you have that ability to take those hours and use them for how you want to use them. And that's what I've done in a lot of ways. Let's talk about the rejection. None of us like rejection. You've been around for a long time. So I guessing there was not very hard to find a publisher but you still need to work with people inside the publisher. And yes. all these people may didn't like what you wrote or how you wrote yeah. it. 
Tell me about more about how do you cope with rejection and how do you overcome this problem? Yeah. I got to say, with this book, I didn't have too much rejection because they had one expert that had a background. But of course, not everyone has a background in all the topics I wrote on. And they just was really were, can you give a better explanation or a personal anecdote to this? It wasn't kind of rejection. However, if you're looking at rejection, if you don't have rejection in your life, you know what, you're not really living because everyone has rejected at some point. And I've had articles rejected I thought were great from publications. And, and you just can't take it personally. But you really, I said, this article is great. And then I sent it to another publication. They loved it. I think it's really that the good news about being in the digital world now is you have a lot of options. It used to be that you have to go out and write a manuscript and send it in by mail or later on by email. And then you wait for a week or whatever and you get something back. Nowadays, there's so many publications, particularly in our world, cybersecurity, you can, you can pick from 30 different sources and they're all good. And it's all promoted stuff. They're all online. And I write for a lot of them, like the dark reading and Homeland Security Today and stuff like that. But I know that they're not going to everything I write. I also fit their agenda. And so I think the whole thing about not everyone's going to love you and everything you do. There's always like a student that doesn't like the class, but there's most of the students love the class. That's just the way it is in life. Not everyone's an exact match. And I think it's hard for younger people to get over that now, particularly since they're raised in a digital world where they're measured by their acceptances and likes online which is creating a lot of anxiety, by the way. But I think being looking back and looking older, that you, you can reflect on this stuff and not take it personally and say, okay, that person could do it. I don't care what they think. It takes away any kind of animosity or vengeance you may have against that. Why did they take that? And that, that happens. And it's just like in inventions too. People make patents and inventions all the time that are rejected. And startups too. Some of the best startups in the world were rejected many times. And I guess the best analogy is Harry Potter. The author that wrote Harry Potter, I think was rejected 500 times your manuscript. And now she's a billionaire. Rejection is part of the challenge. This is very powerful. Not a question I usually ask, but I think it's very important. There is a lot of, let's call it noise, a lot of information, a lot of data right now. For your book to be known, that people will even know this book exists, you need to do marketing. Yes. So did you think about how you're going to go to market? What do you want to do? How are you going to maybe use the book later on? Yeah, I've been thinking about that because, yeah, you, you can't rely, rely on the publisher. The publisher sends it to the bookstores and promotes it that way. But nowadays, you have to promote it continually because you social media. And you think that you post it once, that everyone's seen it and they haven't. You have to do it perpetually. You have to go network to your friends. You have to do book signing events, which I'm doing my first one in October 17th in Washington. That's what you have to do. It's no different. It's a process. And you have to make yourself known. And you rely on your friends. And, and eventually, when I'm, I get the ebook version of it, which will be soon, I'm going to I'll send you a copy and stuff. Reviews, people endorsements. And it's a perpetual marketing thing. But I've, I've, I worked in marketing, so I know how it works for branding. And, and really, you're branding your book and you're branding yourself. And things like this, which I'm doing with you, it, it basically, the people that follow you and know you now have information about the book. you got to continue to do that. And then eventually, hopefully, TV, radio, other places too. So it's a buildup. Did you were thinking about audio version as well? Yes, I think that they do. I think they'll go to that. I follow what the editors suggest first. I think the first thing was the hard copy because a lot of books don't go to hard copy nowadays. They go to bookstores. Or a lot of them are ebooks and soft covered and, and soft marketed. So when they make a decision to go hard copy and market it to the books, it's a different process. So they want to make sure that the hard copy is the first in line. And I understand that. Makes sense. Thank you, Chuck. A lot of good information. For now, people want to do the pre-order. Where do they go to find the book? Yeah, Inside Cyber by Chuck Brooks. And you can go to Amazon, you can go to Barnes & Noble, and you can go to Target. All three of them, our websites have it available for pre-order already. I like hard copy books still, old-fashioned that way. Can't read everything online. And it is difficult to read a book online sometimes. You just It's not the same as having it in front of you and opening it and sitting in the chair. I see the value of that. I'll add the uh link to the show notes as well. You can find it. I'm going to post on LinkedIn as well. Chuck, thank you very much. Good luck with the book. You're doing a lot of amazing work. Thank you for having me. And you too.